Um, well, here we are. Okay, yeah, we've got lots to do today. So let's let's just get to it. Um, and if you would head over to the agenda. Wonderful, okay. So I'm gonna take just a minute to walk you through the agenda today. Uh, my colleagues will introduce themselves at the start of this, their sessions. Uh, they will be talking about our community heroes. Uh, our guest speakers will share their stories um, of building the research nexus and we'll bring you up to speed on the state of membership and metadata funding and metadata. And then finally, we'll have uh, the results of the election. We will have time for questions and answers uh, after the talks. So please add your questions to the Q&A box um, as we're allowed about 15 minutes to discuss them. Uh, we will have, um, we'll mention that if anyone is interested in something in the Q&A, you can upload it by just making a comment there. And that way we'll know uh, which questions people are most interested in and answer those first. It'll help us prioritize. We will be recording and we'll share uh, the recordings with everyone in a few days, along with the transcript and the Q&A. Okay, uh, that about does it, let's get started. So Ed, may I pass it over to you to kick us off with our vision and strategy. Right, uh, thank you, Rosa. And uh, I will uh, just advance the slides here, but uh, before I uh, get, um, on to my talk, uh, I'd like to uh, welcome everyone uh, today. Thank, thank you for joining. Um, and before I talk about our vision and mission, I want to uh, let everyone on the uh, call know and the members in particular that uh, voting uh, in the elect the board election is still open. It's gonna be open until about, until exactly 30 minutes past the hour at uh, 1630 UTC. So, um, uh, most of our members participating in the board election have already provided a proxy and cast their votes in advance. Uh, but if you are the voting member representing your organization and you haven't already voted, you can do so now using the link uh, that was previously sent at the end of September via email. It would have come from eBallot, uh, the voting platform we use. Um, <clears throat> so if you've previously voted, you do still have the chance to supersede your proxy vote. Uh, uh, and uh, cast a new vote. Uh, and to do that, uh, you can uh, email Lucy, uh, our Director of Finance and Operations and overseeing the election. Her email is in the, the top of the screen. And so, um, uh, yeah, you, you can do that. Uh, and there'll be more from uh, Lucy on governance uh, and, the, and presenting the election results uh, at the last part of the meeting today. So you have about uh, 24 minutes left if, if you still uh, wanted to vote. Uh, but having said that, uh, I wanted to start things off talking about Crosshair's uh, vision and strategy. Uh, uh, I'm going to keep my remarks relatively short because uh, we'll be hearing from Crossref colleagues, members of the community, uh, and hopefully uh, from, uh, from you as well uh, attending today. So please comment in the chat, ask any questions uh, in the, in the Q&A, and then uh, we're having a, a chance to mingle uh, after in a more informal setting after the meeting today, so there'll be more information about that. Um, this is our <clears throat> third annual meeting now that we've held online, um, and the pandemic was the original reason a few years ago in 2020 that we moved the annual meeting online, uh, but we found that more people could attend online without the costs, uh, the travel time, and the environmental uh, impact. Uh, so uh, we've decided to keep the meetings online uh, permanently going forward. Um, and uh, the other thing <clears throat> that I said last year was uh, that uh, it wasn't a time for business as usual. And uh, it still isn't. So I guess we just need to recognize that uh, there probably is never a time for, for, for business as usual. Uh, this year, uh, at the beginning of the year, we saw pandemic restrictions easing, still very much with us, but travel has, has resumed. Uh, but then we also saw the invasion of uh, Ukraine and uh, increased sanctions and now inflation and cost of living uh, crises in many countries. And um, I think it's still true, though, that uh, Crossref and the scholarly research ecosystem uh, have shown a lot of resilience, uh, but that takes consistent effort and a lot of hard work and collaboration uh, by, uh, by people. And so we're gonna be talking uh, about community engagement today uh, and how we can all uh, work together uh, to, to have, that, have, have that resilience. Uh, because one thing that hasn't changed over the last year is that open research and open scholarly infrastructure 
are essential to improving scholarly research and communication. Uh, and ultimately uh, advancing human knowledge. And uh, Crossref has an important role to play in that. Uh, so uh, that's where our uh, vision and, and mission are focused. So I wanna talk about those now. So the vision is about where we wanna to get to in the future. This is uh, a vision that is shared by other others in, in our space, uh, but we want to uh, see a rich and reusable open network of relationships, connecting research organizations, people, things, and actions, a scholarly record, that the global community can build on forever for the benefit of society. As I said, we can't do this alone. Collaboration is really important. And we'll be hearing about uh, today from some of the other speakers about how uh, we're uh, enabling uh, this, this vision in, in, practical, in practical terms. And also I'm gonna be coming back to talk a little bit about the, the scholarly record to highlight the, the importance of that for us. Now, <clears throat> whereas the vision is about where we wanna to get to, the mission is more about uh, who we are and what we do. And uh, uh, we've had this mission for, for, for a number of years, uh, and I think it still holds up, uh, holds up very well. Uh, but what I wanted to do uh, was talk about uh, some of the uh, specific examples, uh, and one particular example, I think, uh, that, that demonstrates how um, <coughs> our, our mission and the values uh, that, that we have actually have a practical, have a practical impact. <clears throat> so, uh, last year, uh, in 2021, we reported that the cross Board of Directors had voted to adopt the principles of uh, open scholarly infrastructure, uh, and we did our first assessment against uh, those, those principles uh, at the end of the year, at the end of 2021. And then I'm happy to report that, uh, in, uh, um, that in earlier in 2022, we did, we did the update. I think it was off a year there, sorry, 2020. But uh, in 2022, beginning of this year, we did an updated assessment of uh, uh, against the principles. And there are a couple of areas where, where we, things have changed and improved. So it had a, a practical, uh, pra practical impact. And uh, you can see here on the side, this is the, 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 the latest uh, uh, review that we've done. So uh, those are available on, on, on uh, on our blog, if you want to, uh, if you want to see the uh, see the details, but what I wanted to highlight was a practical uh, outcome of adopting uh, POSI. Um, is that uh, in April we announced that by default all the references to positive with Crossref would be open, uh, and in June we updated our membership terms and our system uh, to enable this. And a uh, big thanks to to all the Crossref staff who worked very hard to make to make that happen and also to the board who, who approved this decision. And so this is a major development for open data uh, because previously references were the uh, only Crossref metadata that wasn't openly available. Uh, members could set their references to closed or limited distribution. So this went against uh, the principles of open scholarly infrastructure, our vision and mission, uh, and, and it made the system uh, more complicated than it than it needed to be. Uh, so um, uh, I think though the most important aspect of making this change was the impact uh, and the benefits for the wider scholarly research uh, ecosystem. And uh, I think this was, uh, uh, you know, we uh, just the blog post here, we 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 confirmed that uh, that this happened uh, in in June, announced in April, and, and uh, uh, implemented in June. So that was a, a great development earlier this year. But also, I think in September, there was a Nature editorial highlighting the importance of this for the whole scholarly research ecosystem. And uh, there were references from uh, 60 million, mainly articles. I don't think it was it's 100% articles, but uh, ha having these available openly uh, make, makes a big, big, big difference. Um, and uh, I also uh, wanted to uh, to highlight, though, uh, one aspect of this was uh, a particular quote uh, from this article uh, highlighting the importance of uh, uh, that open references is a really positive step, but it's uh, it's it's not enough. And um, what they've said here, and here's the quote with, of course, with the proper citation and uh, DOI link, uh, depositing all relevant metadata in Crossref should become the norm in scholarly publishing. So uh, we've made great progress over the last uh, few years, and uh, there's been some analysis of the metadata that we have, and we'll be hearing lots of more about metadata uh, later today in the in, in, from various speakers. But I really want to encourage all Crossref members to review the participation reports, 
and make sure that you're registering all uh, the metadata, uh, all the relevant metadata with us. And we have lots of information about what, what is the relevant uh, metadata, but it's, it's, it's really critical that we do this because uh, we want to capture the scholarly record. And so uh, Crossref members include organizations that produce research objects and materials. So it's not just articles and we don't have just uh, publishers, so there's publishers, societies, universities, funders, research institutions, researchers themselves, and um, and they establish a, a persistent record. And that, having that tied to persistent and unique identifiers and uh, supplying uh, this information uh, in uh, open in an open and machine readable way uh, is 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 really important and a key key part of what uh, what. Crossref does, but we want to also maintain this record for the long term uh, and have an important layer of context. And this will est help establish the integrity of the scholarly record, uh, as well as ensuring that it's something that can be built on by the uh, whole community and improving scholarly, scholarly communications. Um, so we talk about the integrity of the scholarly record. So it's important to note, though, that we don't assess the quality of content or the integrity of the research process, but uh, the record itself uh, can be used as evidence and there can be metadata that uh, that indicates uh, what uh, uh, and puts the indicates what was done to the content, um, but also uh, how the outputs fit into the uh, wider scholarly record. And this can be through uh, ORCID IDs, uh, ROAR IDs for affiliations, funding and licensing information, and, and a lot of uh, really important information. So. Uh, Crossref in terms of the scholarly record and the integrity of it, we want to focus on enriching metadata that can act as trust signals. Uh, and while we're doing that, we want to keep uh, membership barriers to membership and participation as low as possible so that we can also have an in inclusive scholarly record. Uh, and, and, and this is really important for what we do. And then this leads us to uh, the research nexus. We'll be hearing again more about that. Uh, today, and uh, this is capturing what we want to do. We want to bring together all the different aspects and the disparate pieces of the scholarly record, have persistent identifiers, connect them, but establish relationships uh, uh, between them and, and enable them to act as, uh, to have important uh, important role in providing evidence, but also uh, proven, providence, uh, provenance and also uh, uh, persistence over, over time. So we've made a lot of progress, but there's still a, a lot more uh, to do. And uh, this is really critical going forward and it will help us uh, uh, fulfill our mission, but also reach that uh, vision uh, that we have going forward. Um, that I think will uh, will be really valu valuable, and it takes uh, all of us and the whole community. And so, on on that note, uh, I will uh, finish and say thank you very much, and uh, hand over to uh, talk about that uh, community aspect with with our uh, next speaker. So we'll just swap over uh, our sharing. Uh, please remember, you can uh, ask questions and. Uh, Okay. okay, over to you, Vanessa. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Uh, should be able to see my screen now, I hope. Um, so in this section, we just want to highlight some contributions from people in our community who really helped to make our work possible. Um, so the first people I would like to mention are our, is our ambassador team. So our current ambassador team consists of 42 volunteers around the world, including representatives from Mexico, Colombia, Brazil, Kenya, Tanzania, Cameroon, Taiwan, Singapore, Malaysia, Mongolia, Indonesia, Ukraine, Uzbekistan, Nigeria, Turkey, Australia, and, and more. Um, and now ambassadors work in a variety of different roles, um, including publishers, editors, librarians, researchers. But they all share an enthusiasm and belief in our work, um, as well as a commitment to work with others in their local community to help them to get to grips with all things Crossref. So I want to officially recognize the amazing work that these people are doing on, on our behalf. Um, we are able to then help them, um, give them a level of support to make their lives easier when talking to others about Crossref. And at the same time, it improves our global representation and our own knowledge of the different communities uh, that we work with. Our team's grown quite a lot this year with many new faces added to the group. Um, and there's been lots of exciting achievements made. So I'll touch on a few of the uh, key highlights this year. 
So alongside running uh, their own training events, answering queries and translating information for their own communities, uh, we've collaborated a lot with our ambassador team on a number of initiatives this year. Um, that's, this has included ambassadors running several training sessions uh, for the team themselves, including reviewing and improving our presentation materials, contributing to blogs, answering questions and providing updates in the community forum, providing feedback on our plans and helping us with beta testing, helping us to run multilingual webinars, um, including an Asia Pacific series that was run in collaboration with Data Site and ORCID, um, a Portuguese maintaining your metadata webinar, um, an Indonesian participation reports webinar, and an Arabic webinar series uh, that we just finished last week that was also run uh, in collaboration with Knowledge E. And one of the biggest achievements this year by our ambassador team is actually taking place right now. Uh, so we're currently running four in-person satellite events uh, for this annual meeting. Uh, they're taking place in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, Nairobi, Kenya, Vilnius, Lithuania, and Ankara in Turkey. Um, and these events include local guest speakers, panel discussions, a watch party of this very meeting, and networking sessions. So not only is this the first time uh, that we've ever done satellite events, um, but it um, also is the first time that we've gone back to in-person events since the pandemic, and the first time that our ambassadors have run uh, these types of events without one of us there in attendance as well. Uh, so thank you so much to the ambassador uh, organizers of these events and to all the attendees. Uh, we hope you're finding it a really useful and enjoyable experience. And we look forward to hearing back on how it all went. Um, so one more thing I would like to mention um, is to make a special mention of those community members who contribute to our various advisory groups, interest groups and committees. So advisory and working groups, they help us to stay focused and inclusive. And we also have more formal committees that have a role specified in the bylaws or that are set up by the board with a particular remit. So we'd like to thank everyone for their involvement and contributions in our range of different community groups. And But there are a few special mentions that we'd also like to make. So advisory groups tend to be established for uh, services or ongoing themes to get input and advice from our members and our stakeholders. So here a special thanks goes to Anne Coghill from ACS who retired at the end of June and made significant contributions to the Similarity Check Advisory Group. Lauren Flintoff from IOP is the new chair of this group and has been heavily involved this year in the beta testing and product development of Authenticate version 2. The volunteers of the Funder Advisory Group also deserve a special mention for the work that they're currently doing on creating a set of recommendations for improving the adoption of grant identifiers. And similarly, there's been fantastic work in the preprints advisory group on the recommendations for preprint metadata. And I've added a link uh, on the on the uh, slide there for the forum post on this particular topic. So if you want to read more about the preprint recommendations, uh, you can read it there. Interest groups are more like community discussion forums, so they're a bit more informal and broad in scope. And an honourable mention here goes to Bill Kasdorf for all of his help on the accessibility of DOI links consultation. Again, I've added a link to Jennifer's blog, so if you want to read more about the new proposed guidelines that have been developed, then you can do so there. And finally, our committees. The executive and audit committees uh, are exclusively for board members, whereas the nominating and the membership and fees committees are also open to regular Crossref members. These committees enable us to have effective and representative governance, which is key to enabling us to achieve our mission. If anyone has an interest in contributing to these committees, then just contact Ginny or Lucy to get involved. And I'll now pass over to Isaac, who's going to talk some more about some of the trends in our technical support. Thank you, Vanessa. My name is Isaac Farley, Technical Support Manager here at Crossref. I'm here today to talk about how and where we support all of you. Thus far in 2022, our technical support team has answered 8,640 technical support tickets. These are from requests submitted to us at support at crossref.org or entered into our contact us form on the website. If you've emailed us before or contacted us via the website, you've likely exchanged message messages with Arlie, our support contractor. Arlie's also an ambassador. Or you may have talked to one of our full-time staff members, Evans, Kathleen, Paul, Shane, or myself. I'm lucky to have brilliant, warm, and responsive colleagues. We typically get back to those one-on-one -on -one requests quickly with clear answers and or actions. And you'll see we get a range of questions, many about how to register your content or update metadata. Sometimes we get authors or, or metadata users who suggest improvements to the metadata record. 
or we get technical folks who want to get into the details of the XML itself. And we also have a large number of metadata users who are using our APIs and have questions about retrieving metadata registered by our members. So a wide range of topics, right? But not all of these private exchanges are unique questions. And we want to have more of these exchanges out in the open, in a public space where we can all benefit. So how about our community forum at community? Dot .crossref.org. Dot if you haven't visited yet, I'll request now that you go there first next time before hitting send on an email to support at crossref.org or prior to completing a contact us form. And you won't be alone in the forum. The forum has had more than 250,000 page views this year compared to the same time period last year when we launched it. So a lot of growth. It continues to grow in popularity because of heavy users like our top 10 most active com community contributors listed on the slide on the screen now. Some of these top 10 community contributors are also ambassadors. So they're not only viewing messages in the forum, they're also responding to those messages. So messages into the forum are not only seen by those warm staff members I mentioned in the previous slide, but you've also got the eyes and ears of a growing community. Ambassadors like Adilson, Bruna and Anjum are three most active contributors in the forum. And thank you to all who have joined the community forum and who have been reading and, and contributing there. And we really appreciate it. So we have the ambassadors, we have staff, but we also have other Crossref members, funders, metadata users, sponsors, service partners, researchers, and on and on and on. I've seen these exchanges in the community forum yield richer responses because of the wealth of experience and perspectives drawn there within. And like I said, the next time you're looking for real world examples of content registration or metadata retrieval, or you have an inkling to learn more about XML, maybe you're feeling brave. We have a great series in the community forum called the ticket of the month. Um, our support team mines these real examples submitted to us via email and, and on the contact us form. Um, these are usually naughty questions that sometimes require all of us to unpick. Um, but we turn those into posts and those posts are linked from this slide. So take a look. And maybe we'll see you on this leaderboard next year, or maybe you'll just have that question answered by another member of the community, that one like MKOC, the username on this slide, that you needed so much. Now I'm going to turn it over to Cora Korzak, our head of community engagement and communications to continue on the theme of building the research nexus together. Thanks. Thank you. Um, thank you, Isaac. All right, just a quick screen sharing switch, and here we go, Slideshow. So uh, my name is uh, Cora Kodatz, uh, and I'm Head of Community and, uh, Engagement and Communications for Crossref. Uh, and it's uh, my great pleasure to present this um, session of Flash Talks, uh, which basically is um, uh, is presenting our our community members are presenting their efforts uh, into making uh, a kind of into collectively building a robust um, research nexus together. So uh, we received several different uh, we received several um, uh, ideas or, or projects and initiatives that uh, that are presented to you. Uh, and uh, you can view them all in our community forum, again, uh, that Isaac has mentioned already, um, in a dedicated se uh, section for posters. Uh, and here, during this session, we'll hear from five, uh, or from six different speakers who will uh, who'll cover um, those five topics that are included uh, in the, in the um, poster session, uh, but obviously they, they, don't, um, uh, they don't cover all of the different topics that you can see there. Uh, so we will, without um, uh, further ado, I just wanted to say that um, we will have a joint uh, Q&A session at the end of those flash talks. Uh, but please uh, feel free during um, during any of the talks to drop down your questions in the Q and A panel, and we'll get to them uh, when all presenters will have um, will have finished their their talks. So uh, we'll first invite uh, Hans de. Um, uh, Jonja uh, and Bianca Kramer. Hans uh, is a director of the National Initiative uh, Open Science and Dutch research, uh, and is uh, with the Dutch Research Council uh, and WO. 
And Bianca Kramer uh, is with the uh, Sesame Open Science. Okay, so, and here is their presentation. Uh, uh, and we start the, the video too, or are, are, am I going to present without the uh, video? Sorry, Cora. I'm happy to um, turn your video on for you. Yeah, Just thanks. Minute. In the meantime, I just uh, start the presentation. So uh, thanks for having me here and uh, at, the, at this uh, conference. Uh, very happy to be here. My name is Hans Jonge from the Dutch Research Council, and I'm joined uh, indeed uh, uh, here with my colleague uh, Bianca Kramer from Sesame Open Science, um, previously Utrecht University Library. Uh, and we are here to present a, a small research um, uh, on uh, the uh, completeness and availability of funder data in Crossref. Uh, and the main conclusion of our research is already in the middle of uh, this slide. Um, uh, based on the research we conducted, we think that uh, actually uh, at least some publishers really need to step up their efforts to deposit this important aspect of metadata to Crossref. Um, so the reason we started this inquiry is because we uh, were interested in the availability and the completeness of uh, open funder data in Crossref. As we all know, uh, publishers uh, can share this information, can deposit this information since 2013 when the FundRef uh, initiative was launched. Uh, they can do, they can deposit funder information uh, when registering a DOI, uh, or they can even uh, at a later stage update that metadata uh, to a already uh, existing DOI. And uh, from previous research, we already uh, also know that over the years, the uh, amount of funding information in CrossF have um, has um, increased quite considerably, uh, and that currently twenty five percent of all records in CrossF uh, contain some kind of uh, uh, funding information. But actually, it's very hard to evaluate that figure of twenty five percent. We do not really know whether that is a lot or whether it's not uh, so much. Um, uh, um, because, of course, not all publications will be the result of external funding. Um, so not all DOIs will, uh, in the end, uh, have or contain funding information. And basically, um, we do not actually know whether all publishers actually deposit funding information to Crossref and to what extent they do. So that's why we uh, took a sample of 5,000 5, DYs, uh, DYs being the result of registered uh, uh, research uh, by researchers funded by the Dutch Research uh, Council, NWO. And theoretically, of course, you uh, would expect that uh, all the uh, all these DOIs contain funding information, at least when the authors have uh, disclosed this information to the publisher when submitting their, their uh, manuscripts. Interesting enough, uh, from our research, we see that although all of these 5,000 DOIs are the result of funded uh, research uh, by the Dutch Research Council, not all of them do contain uh, funding data in Crossref. 67% uh, of the records contain some kind of funding information, but only 53% correct, correctly uh, identify NWO as the funding council, and only 45% of the uh, DOIs also use the persistent identifier for NWO. Uh, and as you can see in the graph at the middle of this poster, there are quite some differences between the uh, various publishers. So you can see there's uh, a small group of mainly society presses 
that have funding information for almost all of their uh, publications. There's a very large group of large commercial pub publishers that have funding data for around 60 to 70% of the publications. But there's also still a group of uh, publishers that do not seem to deposit funding information for any of their publications. Uh, Cambridge University uh, Press and ADP uh, Science uh, being the examples here at hand. Of course, um, one explanation uh, of the lack of funding information in Crossref for these publications could be that uh, authors did not disclose this information to the publishers. Um, uh, so, and, and, and therefore the, those publishers could also not have uh, shared this information uh, with Crossref. And to test that hypothesis, we also looked at the av availability of funding data for our uh, sample in some of the um, uh, commercial databases, Web of Science, Scopus, and Dimensions. Uh, and from this analysis, uh, it appears that uh, actually these databases are able to capture funding information for a substantial number of extra publications that do not have funding information cross in, in Crossref. And this shows that for a large number of publications in our data sets, actually the funding information is available. Mostly they, they, this information has just been um, uh, made available by the author uh, and also is included in the funding section of the manuscript. Web of Science, Scopus and Dimensions are therefore uh, able to extract that data uh, and include it into their databases. But somehow it appears that uh, some, at least some publishers, have difficulties in collecting this data and depositing this data to uh, Crossref themselves. Um, and in the graph on the right hand side of uh, our poster uh, is a nice illustration, we think, uh, of the differences between the publishers. What you can clearly see is that. Uh, web of science scopes and dimensions are able to extract uh, funding information for quite a lot of extra publications that, that apparently the publishers uh, have difficulty of capturing them uh, 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 themselves. So from our study, uh, we conclude that yes, funding data uh, is uh, uh, on the rise in Crossref. 25% of records have funding information but some publishers really, in our view, need to step up their efforts and capture this data and deposit it to Crossref. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Hans. Uh, excellent. Um, right. So this is our first speaker. As I said, the Q and A. Um, you can ask. You, you can put your questions right now in the Q and A panel, uh, and we'll have the joint Q and A at the end of the session. And now um, I would like to invite. Uh, uh, Javier uh, Arias, uh, the lead software the engineer at Open Book Publishers, to talk uh, to us about the uh, thoughts open metadata. Also, I'm very happy to be corrected on my pronunciation uh, of your name, uh, of the name of the initiative or your own. Uh, thank you very much. Go ahead, Xavier. Uh, thank you so much, Cora. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Javier Arias, and today I'll be presenting Toad. Uh, Toad is named after the Egyptian god of writing, so nobody really knows how to pronounce it. Uh, so any attempt is fine, to be honest. Um, Toad is basically a platform where publishers can manage their metadata and disseminate it to uh, various repositories. It has been developed as part of the Copin project, which is funded by Research England and the Arcadia Fund, and is currently being used in production by all the members of the Scholar-led consortium who were involved in the pilot but we have recently um, opened registrations to the wider community of open access publishers. Um, the target group of Toad users are small to medium open access book publishers who are currently struggling to produce all the various metadata formats um, required by the various outlets they, they distribute their data and content to. <clears throat> we created Toad to serve as the canonical source of data for these publishers since 
each repository has their own metadata requirements. Um, for example, many platforms support Onyx, but not all of them give the same meaning to the same Onyx field. And so we normally say that Toad is like a Rosetta Stone. Uh, publishers can use Toad to input their data and then automatically output it um, in Onyx, KBART, um, JSON, CSV, and so on um, in these formats that are compliant with the requirements of each platform. And these platforms such as um, OAPEN, DOEV, uh, JSTOR, Project Muse, EBSCOhost, and, and many more, of course, including um, Crossref. We have also found that despite all the current um, open access mandates and all the efforts for open access, it is still very hard for book publishers to flag their, their books as being open access when distributing them to certain platforms. And, and Toad helps them to achieve this. It is purposely built uh, with, with open access in mind. And it is worth mentioning that all the metadata records output by Toad are open under a CC0 license, and all the code is open source. We also have open APIs that allow interoperability with other platforms and services. And we are in the process of incorporating as a nonprofit here in the UK. We are offering Toad free of charge to those publishers who wish to disseminate their content themselves. And we also have a dissemination service for those who would prefer we, we manage it uh, for them. And as part of this service, we have also created a network of university repositories to collectively provide effective archiving for open access uh, books. As for the relevance to Crossref, we are very excited to have recently launched a new release of Toad that fully supports Crossref's uh, schema for books, um, book series, uh, chapters, and book sets. And so we cover all the fields that are available in the um, Crossref schema, including references, funding information, author affiliations, abstracts, and, and so on. And we are now working towards automating the upload of these files as part of our dissemination service to allow a complete synchronization of the data the publisher inputs on Toad and the DOI record on Crossref. I think by trying to keep it too short, I think I've managed to keep it um, too short. <laughs> um, that was what I have. Um, thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Severe. Uh, this is a really interesting and exciting tool, I think. Uh, okay, so we'll now move on to the presentation from uh, Julie Lambert from the Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania St uh, State University Press. Um, and she will talk to us about a poster on going it together, DOI correction journey. Um, so I think this is one of those stories of kind of where people are willing to share their um, you know, the vulnerability of doing something or correcting a mistake of, of a predecessor or of a system. And uh, I, um, I'm i very excited to hear uh, also from Julie. So please take the stage and here is your question. Great, thank you so much. Hi everyone, I'm Julie Lambert and I'm the journals manager at Penn State University Press. Uh, going it together is a very common theme for university presses who do a lot with a little. I know that uh, we always seem to find a way forward through collaboration, and um, I know I'm always learning from others, and this year I had what I like to call my crash course in all things Crossref, and despite everything I've gone through this year, I know I still have a lot to learn. Um, so I got started on this DOI correction journey, as I started to call it, because, you know, half the fun is getting there, right? So we started working with Duke University Press uh, and the Scholarly Publishing Collective to migrate a large portion of our, um, of our list over to a new platform. And for this migration, I knew that we had some problems with our tagging for Crossref, um, especially you know, abstracts were not being ingested. And so I was really excited for this migration because I wanted to take the opportunity to put some tags in there and kind of enrich our data. Um, so you know, for me at a university press, it's really hard to make changes to XML after an issue has published since we outsourced that service with a vendor. Um, and we were the only partner with the collective that was doing our own conversion. So I'm very grateful to the team at Duke, especially Patty Chase, for all of her help during the process. Uh, she provided a lot of guidelines and resources and experience that really helped to move us forward. And through the process, we thought everything was going really well until about the time the platform was launching, we received a very large report of failed deposits from Crossref, which also pointed out that some of the PSUP DOIs did not 
transition over correctly to the new platform. Um, and so we had a bunch of our content that had some DOIs that were just wrong. And some of those correct were actually deposited successfully. Other DOIs did not deposit, but they were all posted on the platform. And so we had around 2,700 conflicts and hundreds of DOIs that were not deposited, which was like, yikes, like a huge issue. So we immediately went to revert all the DOIs to back to where they were, which you know took a little bit of time. And in going through those DOIs, we started to learn even more about our metadata. And I started to learn about how to fix it, which is what I hope, you know, this is sort of where the journey started. It was sort of just enriching our data. And now I'm still on this road of um, trying to make things even cleaner and better for moving forward. So the other members of the collective that were migrating had similar problems and Patty at Duke was you know, overseeing their process. So she and I had a lot of chats about DOIs and it was really helpful to have someone working through the similar, these similar problems um, to share and just troubleshoot with. Uh, the problems that we uncovered, I sort of shoved into three categories. I don't think it's really fair because it seems like there were endless um, situations, but the first one was just duplicate DOIs, you know, two DOIs for the same content. In the spirit of the season, I started calling the second category phantom or phantom DOIs, which are DOIs that are numbers that look and act a lot like a DOI and maybe they populate an XML field, uh, but they have another publisher's prefix and they were never successfully deposited for whatever reason. And then the third category of just title and ownership discrepancies where we had some journals that we had never claimed ownership for, so our deposits weren't going through and others where you know our title was like slightly different than what Crossref had, so they weren't meshing and we had to go through and iron some of these issues out. The situations just felt totally endless and this was a huge learning curve for me especially, um, but I know that we're not alone in these problems. A lot of people and publishers go through similar situations uh, and the everything on you know the Crossref site, the tools to correct your data is so expansive. And when I started to dive into that, I admit I just kind of glossed over because I'm not really a technical person and I don't have the resources in-house to update my XML. And that's where, you know, working with the Crossref team became incredibly helpful. So shout out especially to Isaac Farley for answering all of my incredibly complex questions in a way that I could understand and that could actually, you know, make some progress for our data. So with Isaac's help, we started to clean up our data and resolve some of those conflicts by creating aliases for those duplicates, which was a vast majority of our problems. Uh, we also coordinated efforts to deposit those phantom DOIs where we were permitted to. And we went through and started formally claiming ownership where we could and matching up our titles properly so that things were meshing uh, the way they should have been. And luckily for me, uh, alias mapping and URL URL resolution are two processes that I was actually to update, able to update by submitting an Excel file, which is you know doable for me. That's something I can handle in house. I can't quite handle the uh, XML part. So I'm still working on this project. Uh, we reduced the conflicts from 2,700 to less than 400. Uh, in the grand scheme of our data, that's a really small number, but I felt compelled and responsible to fix these problems because we created them. And then I found out a lot of, we had other problems that I didn't even know about. Uh, so as publishers, uh, we are writing the scholarly record and Crossref is aiding in that initiative. So in a lot of ways, I feel like we are all in this together. Uh, as they say, two people shorten a road. So I look forward to any questions you may have and thank you so much for having me today. Thank you, Julie. Uh, that uh, has been a thrilling story. I can see that uh, some of your vocabulary has been picked up in the chat uh, as exciting and relevant to the time of year. Uh, thank you so much. And um, yeah, we obviously invite questions in the question and answer panel, uh, which there will be uh, time for in just uh, about 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, and uh, now I would like to invite um, Edelson DiMaggio, one of our, um, well, most prolific uh, poster on the forum, as was already apparent, uh, also one of our uh, ambassadors, uh, one of the most active ambassadors. Uh, so Edelson is a librarian at the University uh, Estadual Maringa, uh, and he will talk to us about Cited By and OJS experience. Edelson, you ready? He may have uh, disconnected, so if we could move oh. to the next speaker. Um, 
that would be great. Sure. So in that case, we'll wait for um, to see if Edison is able to rejoin us. Uh, and uh, in the meantime, I would like to invite uh, Letty Y. Conrad, uh, who a senior associate at Maverick Publishing, a specialist in North American editor uh, at Learner Publishing, uh, on her poster on with or without about measuring impacts of books metadata. Thank you, Cora, and thank you everyone for including us in, uh, in this meeting. I'm pleased to provide you all with five minutes of insight, uh, the first sort of public um, sharing of uh, the results coming out of a Crossref sponsored study I'm carrying out with uh, Dr. Michelle Erberg, my partner in crime, uh, who's also uh, lurking in this meeting as well. Uh, in this project, we set out to learn if scholarly books with DOIs and the yummy associated metadata were more easily discovered in Google Scholar than those books without DOIs and the associated metadata. And we found that DOIs do seem to have an indirect influence on the discoverability of scholarly books in Google Scholar. Uh, but we found no direct linkage between DOIs and the quality of indexing or access to full text. Um, we have been told that Google Scholar does not use DOI metadata in their search index, but in our mixed method study of more than 100 books, uh, those are from 17 different publishers, uh, we did observe that books with DOIs are generally more discoverable than those without DOIs. This study was designed to evaluate uh, the impacts of metadata, the benefits of metadata to end users. Uh, and given its popularity with a range of stakeholders, we decided to focus our attention on measuring the impact of metadata uh, as it influences discoverability in the mainstream web. And because of its uh, popularity with many different regions, we focused our attention on Google Scholar. What we did was rate the search performance of selected scholarly books. Um, those represented monographs as well as edited formats, um, everything right across, uh, you know, hard science, life science, um, uh, allied health, uh, humanities, social sciences, et cetera. Uh, we looked at both open access and traditional models for books and from all sorts and sizes of publishers. We really tried to represent, uh, you know, the full field as best we could. We executed known item searches that were designed to simulate common researcher practices. And this is based on uh, both our own research uh, and uh, awareness of various scholarly practices, but also uh, informed by the literature, library and information science research in particular. Uh, we rated the performance based on a five point scale. We developed a rubric that measured the degree of friction in the user experience. Uh, friction in a user's ability to locate the book in question. And we then ranked metadata fields associated with those books by their search performance scores. And therein lies the mixed methods. Uh, so we had a, a semi-qualitative approach to testing search performance uh, but those were then assigned scores and averages and, uh, and other uh, quantitative measures were used to evaluate that. And we learned that high value fields uh, in the book's metadata uh, retrieval and discovery experience in Google Scholar include the primary title, especially when paired with one or more terms from the subtitle or keywords related to the field of study, and or author or editor surnames. Surprisingly, our discoverability scores showed no significant variation in performance by the type of book, um, whether edited or authored. Um, open access titles did perform somewhat better than traditional titles. And humanities and social sciences 
uh, books performed a little bit better than STM books, but really only by a slim difference and um, probably not statistically significant difference. Um, so I, I think our findings will, will probably show a pretty level playing field there. We are finalizing our analysis now, um, but we do have a working theory based on uh, these results. And that is that books with DOIs perform better in Google Scholar, not because Google Scholar necessarily is ingesting DOI metadata uh, uh, knowingly or explicitly, but because the Google Scholar index actually benefits from the structured open metadata that are associated with DOIs. Um, which are used, as we know, downstream by hundreds of services and platforms, and therefore that metadata becomes seeded throughout the mainstream web, with Google Scholar perhaps drawing on uh, many of those resources for their indexing, linking, ranking, etc. So with this sneak peek into the outcomes of this study, please watch this space. Our report is coming out in the spring. And although we studied Google Scholar, we believe that our results and the lessons learned are applicable to other mainstream channels of information seeking and discovery. So we intend to develop a framework based on our findings that can help publishers and other providers measure the impact of their investments uh, in the enrichment and distribution of metadata. So we, we you, welcome your questions and feedback. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Letty. Thank you so much. Uh, that was pretty much spot on on time. Uh, and uh, I am being informed reliably that Edison is back with us. Uh, so uh, any questions for Letty about the uh, books metadata, please uh, put in the uh, Q&A panel. And in the meantime, Edison, please, well, not yet. Uh, would, uh, are you ready to present your poster on Cited by and the OJS experience, please? Hello, everyone. I am start to, uh, to present my, my the first, uh, first uh, work with Cited by and OJS. And because the, the article citations are essential to show the importance for the article in, in your visibility, okay? And in the cross have Cited by services, are uh, available for members to use on their publishing platforms, okay? Various, various platforms. And um, this, this presentation is about open journal system platform, um, version 3.2 or more. It's about to development to a plugin by the PKP, Public Knowledge Project, And, and this plugin is uh, it's all other services, but for NOJS, uh, for example, Scopus, uh, Citation, Google Citations, Numbers, and the Euro, Euro PMC. And uh, we will show how and can, because of members with Probushi in OJS is an utilization to the site I buy. And exists now uh, uh, a Kikuli methodology provided by PKP is a, uh, which utilization to the BSTM journal. It's, my, it's a mathematical journal I, I'm working to uh, executive editor. And for, for the utilization, the, um, the plugin gallery, the, uh, the of about the OJS in the uh, plugin gallery general, exists the plugin for cross hefs uh, cited by LinkedIn. And from in the second, uh, second slide or second image, okay. It's the, the, the step, steps for enable the plugin, okay? And uh, one, one uh, important information, for participation to the site by the uh, 
the journals or publishers, uh, it's uh, necessary to deposit to, to reference linkings, okay? And a, a percent, uh, more to 19 percent, okay? Because the, the editors work to, to deposit the reference linking and in the, is necessary to, to utilization to cite it by services, okay? And it's very, very simple. In the, the, uh, third, um, uh, slides, JS, which uh, utilization and in number three, uh, enable to utilization to the plugin. And the, uh, the four, um, Hello, wait. <laughs> okay. Um, we can hear you now, then uh, it doesn't, don't worry, continue. Okay. Uh, it's, uh, it's very, very simple because um, it, it's interesting because the, the numbers of the citation, in, for example, is the uh, uh, own article in my landing page in OJS, the number of citations cited by it's very similar to the Scopus uh, Scopus citations, and the um, the after to do to uh, to utilization to the plugin, how, how articles in the OJS journals uh, have to do citation by by citations. It's uh, uh, very important for for the editors in Brazil and others editors with publishing to OJS journals. And, and it's a, in the start it's in this year. It, and I, it's so, thank you. And uh, thank you so much. And uh, I, if necessary to contact, send it to a uh, community platform from from other two, two questions. Thank you. Thank you, Edison. Um, thank you so much for the presentation and for providing the poster. Um, and all that, uh, I believe, from another, from one of our satellite events. So thank you so much for multitasking so much. Um, all right, thank you. So this is our uh, the, uh, the the final talk uh, from our guest speakers. Thank you so much to all our uh, to all our guests for presenting their initiatives. Uh, and uh, right now we have a few minutes uh, to uh, go in and uh, dive into some questions. So um, I think there is already um, a, the first question in the question panel. Uh, Lisa, would you like to? Uh, would you like to just ask your question Alana? Sure. Um, so this is a question for Letty. I, I'm really interested in the, the study that you're doing about the impact of DOIs and metadata on discoverability of books. And I was wondering if you were also looking at the Google Books portal as well as Google Scholar in terms of evaluating discoverability. Yeah, thank you, Lisa, for being willing to add to that question live. Um, I, I would say no and yes at the same time. No, we didn't test Google Books uh, explicitly or directly. Um, but uh, my colleague, Michelle, in particular, who uh, evaluated the quality of the search results pages and the metadata presented on those SERPs, uh, Google Books, of course, plays a role uh, in the search index. Um, and uh, the results and links that are presented. So we often saw the top performing publishers and the top performing books included Google Books links. Um, but no, we, we didn't test, um, you know, discoverability or retrieval on Google Books in particular. Um, I believe that that index does include DOIs based on our evaluation of some of the metadata that we've seen, um, but I don't know for sure, I, no authoritative um, word from Google Books whether they are using DOI metadata. Uh, although Google Scholar has has officially said that they they are not using DOIs, um, 
so thank you for that follow-up and keep them coming. We're, we're at the stage where we could really use your feedback and questions. Thank you, everyone. Lovely. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you for the question and thank you for responding, Letty. Um, I encourage everybody to continue uh, sending through your questions. Uh, and in the meantime, I wanted to ask uh, Julie uh, about uh, her project. So you were saying that this is not uncommon in university process, as you know. Uh, did you have did you have many people contacting you, or have you had help from the community about how people were uh, going about correcting their DOIs as well? Um, mostly with uh, Patty Chase at Duke because she was managing the conversion of the other publishers that were moving to the collective and they were running into similar problems. So she and I had a lot of chats just about, hey, have you seen this? Have you heard about this? Like, get a load of this one. Um, but it was mostly uh, the Crossref team that pointed me in the right direction and really helped me to make progress and actually making changes on the Crossref end to the metadata. Thank you, Julie. I wonder if you'll get more questions about that now to assist others. Well, now that I know that you guys have a forum that I can be a part of. <laughs> oh yeah, very much so. I have a question uh, hi. <laughs> about the, do you have to upload the plugin or in this, in the OJS? Um, the plugin does not have necessary upload, okay? The plugin is the, the, in the plugin gallery in the OJS are started in the version 2.2 to the OJS. The cross, the cross, the cross mark, the cross mark, no, the site edge by plugin. It's uh, go to the utilization. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, and uh, I believe uh, before we had a question from Humberto Aguilera uh, for Hans in a Q and A. I, it might have been already answered in writing, but I wonder, um, Humberto, if you'd be willing to ask your question uh live now so that everybody benefits from the response as well yeah uh, hello no thank you just a comment because uh, the, uh, we have seen that uh, many uh, researchers uh, fund uh, their studies so I, i'm wondering whether in the metadata uh, concerning the, the, the funding, it is possible that you can uh, grab this information and uh, rather than uh, making uh, unavailable, you can uh, 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 get, you can provide this information in the, in the funder uh, registry. Thank you, Humberto. Hans, would you be happy to just um, repeat yeah, your, your response? As well? I think this is more a question for the for the for the Crossref team because it it really relates to how Crossref captures funding funding data. Um, so, so maybe they would be better positioned to answer this question. Well, not all of, uh, not all of, uh, all I can, of one. I can, I can, shall I have a go? Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, I think that um, I could probably um, mirror a lot what, um, Hans, what you're saying in terms of um, the, the metadata and the, the funder registry predominantly being set up to be, to, to support the use case that you describe. So as you said, the um, publications that are, um, publications that have been um, 
connected to a particular funder as opposed to sort of being funded by the the author themselves um I haven't seen um although I've only been looking after the, the funder registry for a couple of um for a couple of months haven't we haven't seen a lot of requests from authors to kind of to declare that they funded the research themselves as with everything you know the the schema and the information that we collect is is flexible over time so if we find that there was a need to actively kind of make that distinction between this has been funded by this particular research funder or this has been funded by the author themselves then then we can look into that I think there's another question on why it's actually important to register funder data into Crossref. And I also already answered this question in writing, but maybe it's it's useful to, to uh, repeat that here um, verbally. So um, I, I think uh, that it's really important, very useful to have this, this information into, into Crossref. So funder, funding councils, SNWO, where I work, uh, invest heavily in tracking the research they have uh, uh, funded, uh, but that's obviously very, uh, very complex. They often rely on very expensive systems where they ask their grantees to register the, the outputs from their grants, but they often, uh, often uh, do not know whether that that information is complete. Uh, often researchers are very hesitant to 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 register the, those publications with their funder because the same kind of inf information they uh, uh, often all also have to register with their home institution. Uh, so it would actually be very interesting to see whether this information can be actually open data in the sense that everyone, not only funders, but but everyone interested can make use of this data and therefore i think crossref is very well positioned but then of course uh, um, uh, we we do need to know that the information in crossref is indeed uh, available and is also uh, in a sense complete and from the research uh, we we have done so far uh, at least we can conclude that at least for the output uh, that is stemming from the uh, funding of NWO, uh, what we find in Crossref is still not complete enough, and that uh, that is because uh, of uh, the fact that at least some publishers do not yet uh, register this very important metadata to uh, to Crossref. Yeah, and I think that I think the other you know like Hans again you've illustrated the the funder use cases very well um my colleague um Amanda's written um a couple of blogs recently about you know um information to support you know the the integrity and the the, the context of research that's being published so having information on who funded a piece of research is uh, I I think is an important piece of context for anyone obviously reading the research, but also being able to, to do that analysis, both at an individual funder or across funders to see, you know, who's funding specific research, where is it coming from, potentially identifying um, conflicts of interest or just having that sort of additional information is um, is something um, my colleague said in the um, it's something that's really heavily requested by users of our metadata because it's a different lens into the the research that's that's being published and the data that's being shared so i think that's kind of another use case that we hear about frequently thank you hans and thank you rachel uh, i i've spotted another question in the chat uh, it's a question for edelson uh do you get much feedback from ojs uh, users about cited by plugin and do people have any issues uh, with using it, including things about loading the latest updates? Is it also available? If not, yeah, yeah. now the, the question. <laughs> Can we repeat the question there, Cora? 
Sure. Uh, the question was, uh, whether you get any feedback from the OJS users uh, about uh, the Cited by plugin? I think maybe he's trying to find I, it. <laughs> um, I'm sending it to the to the 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 link to download the to the plugin in the K and elsewhere. It's very very easy, no? It's four four steps in the the OJS the OJS uh, automatically. To this, uh, to refer to the citations in, in the landing page, it's a plugin. A plugin. It's a, it's it's now to the utilization. No problems. It starts to utilize the plugin is in the landing page. Have the numbers of the citations. Thank you, Anderson. Um, okay. All right, well, in that case, we'll conclude our Q&A session. Uh, we've run out of the time for questions. Uh, uh, we will now have um, a very brief uh, break if anybody needs a, a little bit of a stretch of the arms or refill their cup. Uh, and I hope that we'll be able to uh, all come back here at basically um, maybe 18 past the hour. Uh, so we don't, we no longer have the full five minutes I was hoping for. Uh, so <laughs> uh, in that case, a very short break, but should be enough uh, to move your uh, arms around or potentially explore some of the links that have been shared during the session. Uh, I, um, I would like to welcome you back at uh, 18 past the hour when we'll hear from a few more speakers about some updates uh, from Crossref, uh, as well as the all important uh, results of our board election. So see you in, um, in a few minutes. And obviously, if you don't want to move anywhere from your screen, feel free to continue conversations in the chat.
All right, lovely. I think um, the break time has come to an end. I hope we're all gathering back in front of the screens. And uh, I am now going to invite Amanda and Patricia to share uh, some statistics about our membership and currently um, the positive metadata. Great stuff. Thanks, Cora. So hi all, I'm Amanda Bartel. I look after the member experience team here at Crossref. I'm gonna be talking a little bit about the makeup of our membership. And then I'll be handing over to Patricia, our head of metadata, to talk a bit about the metadata that those members are actually registering with us. So Crossref membership is open to organisations that produce professional and scholarly materials and content. So basically, if your content is likely to be cited in the research ecosystem and it's considered part of the evidence trail, then you're eligible to join. And you'll see that that's quite broad a description and that's deliberately broad. Um, and we, we find that many of our members don't necessarily consider themselves to be publishers first and foremost. When members first join, we ask them to sort of describe their organisation type. And as you can see from the results here, actually the largest percentage are from organisations that consider themselves to be universities or research institutes, slightly ahead of organisations who consider themselves to be uh, publishers. And we also have societies, obviously, government agencies, NGOs, but all manner of other different types of organisations, museums, banks. There's even a couple of botanical gardens in there as well. And when members first apply to join, we keep the checks that we run on them fairly low. And that's, again, a deliberate policy. We think it's more important to get these organisations into our infrastructure and contributing to the research nexus um, and hopefully learning a bit about best practice while they're there rather than putting barriers up in place. And, you, and the stats really bear this out. So in the last 12 months, we uh, welcomed 2,322 new members into Crossref and we only actually declined 39 applications. And of that 39, 34 were actually from parts of the same organisation who had had their membership revoked in 2019, trying to rejoin. So when you take that out of the picture, you can see it's a very, a very small number of declined applications. And we generally try and keep the barriers to entry as low as possible. Um, the sponsors programme run by my colleague Susan is a big part of that. So sponsors are organisations who help uh, members join who otherwise maybe wouldn't be able to join because of financial language technical reasons. So sponsors um, pay one membership fee on behalf of the organisations they work with. They also pay the content registration invoices. Some of them actually register content on behalf of the members and most of them provide technical and local language support. Members who work via a sponsor have the same benefits and obligations as any other member. Um, and sponsors are able to charge for their services, but it's often a more cost effective way for those members to join. We also have a limited fee assistance program where we whereby we waive content registration fees for a small number of members in the lowest income countries in the world. Um, and that's facilitated via three of our sponsors. And we're hoping to be able to expand this into a much wider global equitable membership program later on this year. And there may well be more information about that coming before the end of the year. So we now have seven, over 17,500 members. Um, you can see the growth there. And nowadays, new applicants are more likely to be working through a sponsor, more likely to be a small organisation who's using the OJS platform, and a lot less likely than they used to to be um, based in North America or Western Europe. Um, we now have members in 148 different countries across the globe. 
And uh, if we look at the trending countries from just this current year, you can see there's a lot of growth coming from Indonesia, um, where the government puts a lot of support and funding into facilitating uh, registration of DOIs and membership uh, and metadata. Um, but you can also see there's growth from other parts of the world as well, Nigeria, Peru, uh, Malaysia. Um, so uh, members joining us from all over the world. And obviously all those members keep the membership team very busy. So Sally and Rebecca, ably assisted by our two contractors, Kim and Colin. Um, they answered over 12,000 membership tickets last year. Um, they get to us through various different forms, um, people applying for membership, emailing us or sending us something via the contact us form. I put a flavour of the sort of questions that, that the membership team gets there. We also get a lot of questions about invoices and payment, and those we pass on to our billing team, um, who themselves solved over 9,000 tickets in the last year. So Amy, Laura, Maria, Jessica, Ryan, thank you for your help there. And if anyone needs to contact the billing team, they're on billing at crossref.org. So that's a bit of a lightning tour of our members but but what metadata are they registering with us well i'm going to pass you over to patricia to talk about that in more detail patricia hi thanks um yeah so i'm going to share some information about how our metadata is evolving um more towards this uh more complete and complex research nexus that we've been talking about um, I only have a few minutes, so this won't really be a deep dive, but there are some trends. We do support 12 distinct metadata models, a metadata model being a defined structure for the metadata we collect. Some are used more than others. Um, journal articles have consistently been the most deposited item. These, char these charts here, um, they came out orange, so I just threw a pumpkin face on it because... <laughs> Why not? <laughs> These charts show the percent of each supported metadata model. As you can see, it hasn't changed much in the past few years. Um, mostly journal articles, 71.3% um, of everything registered with us currently are journal articles, 15%-ish of books, uh, like 5%-ish of conference pr proceedings and others at a much smaller volume. And if you look at 2021 and uh, 2020, it's pretty much the same thing. So it's been holding steady um, over the past few years. Okay, next slide. I'm not advancing my own slides, so maybe I should be for make a ghost noise or something. <laughs> um, we've added support for a few new, new things over the past seven to eight years, uh, preprints, peer reviews, grants, and I, it's it's interesting to think about whether have they have they had an impact over time or rebuilding a more complete research nexus. Uh, we don't have just because of our, the way our API works. It's really hard to establish what's been registered year to year using querying. So I I went and dug through our past uh, annual reports just to see what we because they give a good snapshot of what's happened in a year. So in 2008, 90% of records were journal articles, 88% in 2011 and 2015, and then down to 78% in 2017. And as I mentioned before, we're down to 71%. Uh, we had a big jump in book re registration between 2015 and 2017, but that's also when we started to re really support a wider range of metadata models like um, preprints and peer reviews and uh, you know, most recently we've had grants. All right, next slide. Over the years, the percentage of journal articles um, registered has increased steadily. It's been fairly consistent. There was a little bit of a bump last year and a 9% increase, but usually it's 6 to 7%. So I think it's pretty safe to infer that the drop in overall article percentage over the years is not because people are registering less journal articles. I think um, everyone on the side on the crossref side of things agrees that you know there are a lot of journal articles being registered, but because of increases in other areas as we register new types of content, we still only have comparatively few preprints and reviews and grants 
registered, but they're increasing quite a bit. And I think I'm really excited to see what happens over the next few years as people come on board and start to register this content, because I think people are seeing the value of registering this sort of content. All right, next slide. So we are also seeing an increase in the rich metadata that helps create the research nexus. There's an increase in references, abstracts, they continue to increase. We've recently added support for RAR identifiers in affiliations. The affiliations overall are increasing, but we've only recently added support for RARs. We already have some, and there aren't, even though there aren't loads registered with us now, but we know there's some activity fomenting in the background. So I, I anticipate that will go up soon as well. All right, next slide. Um, so relationships and metadata are really key to connecting people, research, funding sources, and more. And we're hoping to see more relationships like funding related relationships, translations, and versions, and comments as we work with our members to improve me metadata. But we're right now we're seeing a lot of uh, review relationships, uh, pre uh, relationships connecting preprints to journal articles. Um, which those sorts of relationships are um, either required or best practice in our metadata. But I think we're going to really start working more with our membership to maybe provide support for relationships we don't currently support so that you can really explicitly say how one object is um, connected to another. Um, all right, next slide. This is my last slide. I'll end with this graph, graph of relationships by record type. I think it really stresses how the different types of content grants and more registered with us are necessary to get the full picture of how research evolves. And there are the expected connections between journal articles, reviews, and preprints. But I think in the future, we'll see more relationships with grants in particular. And we'll also hopefully in the future um, have better support for a range of uh, different types of uh, research objects and content and things like um, maybe even non-content like uh, conference event identifiers. So this is a brief overview, but I hope it gives you an idea of where we're heading with our metadata. Thanks. Now over to Dominica. Yes, thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Dominika Tkaczyk, and today I would like to talk about linking grants to research outputs supported by them, in particular, why we need this and how it could be done. I will also share the results of an analysis I performed and present our future plans related to grant linking. But let's start at the beginning. The scholarly record is filled with all sorts of relationships between different types of items. Those relationships are absolutely essential. Without them, everything would be a total chaos and you would have no idea who did what in science. This is also true for relationships related to funding and supporting research. Exposing relationships between research outputs, funders and grants increases the transparency of funding sources of the research, making it easier to assess and trust scientific findings and also contributing to the fight against misinformation and conspir conspiracy theories. No pressure, right? Hmm. Historically, the first element in this picture were research outputs. When the funder registry came into existence and we started assigning persistent identifiers to funders, it became possible to include the funder ID within the metadata of a research output. You can see an example of this on the slide. When such a metadata record is deposited, we immediately know the relationship between the deposited research output and the mentioned funder. Of course, there are cases where the funder DOI is not provided. And in such a situation, if we want to know this relationship, we need to locate the funder using a process called funder matching. Grants with identifiers are the newest element in this picture. The first grants were registered in our system only about three years ago. The metadata of a grant deposited with us always has to contain the funder ID. An example of such a metadata record is shown on the slide. This means the relationship between a registered grant and its funder is always known. And thankfully, we, don't, we do not need to, to do any matching here. Now we have to talk about the elephant in the room, which is the relationship between the research output and the supporting grant. First of all, if we already know the first two relationships, do we even need this one? 
Well, yes, because a funder can and usually does award multiple grants. So knowing which funder supported the research is simply not enough. But how could such a relationship be deposited? Well, in theory, the publisher of a research output could attach the grant DOI to the funding information along with the funder ID. The problem uh, is this is not supported by our deposit schema. Interestingly, when I looked closely at the data, I found nine cases where the grant DOI was provided as the award number. You can see an example of that on the slide. This is technically not correct from the schema perspective, but I definitely understand the urge to do it. Another way of depositing this information is by providing a relationship called finances or is financed by. Such a relationship can be either attached to the research output metadata by a publisher or to the grant metadata by a funder. When this happens, personally, I consider it a good enough reason to celebrate with champagne and confetti. Unfortunately, I was able to find only three um, such relationships among millions of metadata records, and two of them were deposited for test purposes only. This means that for the vast majority of cases, we don't know the relationship between the research output and the grant. And you know, my champagne bottle is still sadly almost full. For this reason, we decided to explore the possibility of establishing those relationships automatically by doing grant matching. Grant matching probably sounds unfamiliar to a lot of people, but you might have heard about bibliographic reference matching before. Those two matching tasks are in fact two flavors of the same thing. In both cases, we are trying to locate an item based on a description of it. This description can take many forms. It could be unstructured text, such as a bibliography section or a citation string in the case of reference matching, or an quadrant text in the case of grant matching. The input can also be structured, for example, containing the metadata given in a citation. In the case of grant matching, that would be the funder metadata and the award number, because this is what we collect as funding information for research outputs. The main goal of my analysis was to explore how grants could be linked to research outputs and to see how many such links we can establish. I focused on, this, on the structured input. I couldn't use the acknowledgement sections because we do not collect them. It also turned out that I would need both funder metadata and award numbers to do the matching. If the funding information contains the funder metadata only, but no award number, this is not enough to point at a specific grant. Similarly, I couldn't use the award numbers without funder metadata because the award numbers are not globally unique. So how can we find the links? The first scenario is simple. The relationship is already in the metadata, either because a grant DOI is given as the award number in the research output, or there is a relationship deposited in the research output or in the grant. This is by far my favorite scenario because in this case, I didn't have to do anything. I could just focus on sipping my champagne while adding those links to my resulting link set. In the second scenario, the research output contains the award number and the funder ID. In this case, I looked at candidate grants with the same award number. I established a link between the research output and the candidate grant if they mention the same funder ID or if their funder IDs are related, either one funder replaced the other or one funder is an ancestor of the other. The information about funder replacements and ancestor descendant relationships can be found in the funder registry. In some cases, the research output does not contain the funder ID and I had to use the funder name instead. Just like before, I looked for candidate grants with the same award number. I established a link between the research output and the candidate grant. If one of the additional conditions is met, these conditions are in fact the same as in scenario two, except we look at funder names instead of funder IDs. I searched for links between the research outputs and grants twice this year, in March and again this October. This gives us the opportunity to compare the numbers and see how they changed in six months. In general, all the total numbers increased, which is expected as we simply have more data now. In October, I found over 23,000 links in total, which is a 15% increase since March. The total number of research outputs with funding information increased by 9%, and at the same time, the number of linked research outputs increased by more, by 15%. And as you can see, we have a similar trend for grants. This suggests that the metadata is getting easier to match as the time goes by. Why would that be? Well, it could be that newer metadata records are more correct and or more complete than older ones. It could also be that in the meantime, some older grants were registered and all of a sudden we were able to match some older research outputs to them. All this is very encouraging. What is worrying is this embarrassingly small percentage of research outputs with funding information that I was able to link. It is less than a, than a quarter of a percent. But first of all, we have to remember that not all the research outputs with funding information also contain the award number, 
which was needed for matching. Uh, if we take this into account, the percentage increases to 0.32%, still not great. Secondly, a lot of grants mentioned in the research outputs might not have been deposited with us to this date. It is hard to calculate the exact number of those cases, but when we restrict the set of research outputs to those with award numbers and with a funder that either has at least one grant itself or whose, or whose replacement or an ancestor or a descendant has at least one grant, then the percentage goes up by a lot to 7.5%. This suggests that indeed the majority of the research outputs cannot be linked simply because they mention a grant that doesn't exist in our system. And finally, I used an exact comparison of the award numbers, meaning that if there are any discrepancies between how the award number was given in the research output and in the grant, I wasn't able to match those. This table shows the breakdown of the matched links by the matching strategy. There were only a few links established based on the presence of the grant DOI in the research output or the presence of the research output DOI in the grant. By far, the majority of links were matched based on the award number and the funder ID. Using the funder name adds only around 5% of the links. We have only just scratched the surface of this issue. There is still a lot to do. First of all, it would be great to increase the fraction of research outputs already linked to grants when they appear in our system. This is and always will be better than matching. We need to work together with the publishers and the funders to achieve that. We also plan to improve the matching strategy, for example, by relaxing the strict award number uh, comparison or by using other relationships between funders. The matching approach needs to be also properly evaluated. And for that, we need to build a good data set. We would also like to make the matched links available through our APIs along with the information where these assertions came from. And finally, we plan to build an open source matching API that will allow everyone to match grants and other types of items as well. Thank you for listening. Um, if you'd like to know more about our R&D projects, please visit the website of the R&D team at labs.crossref.org. You will find links to past and current projects there, along with the link to the research roadmap. And if, are in, if you are interested in collaborating on the matching API or on the matching strategies, I would love to hear from you. And now over to Lucy Ofish, the Director of Finance and Operations. Thanks, Dominika. Um, I'm going to share my screen. OK. Um, I'm Lucy Ofish. I'm the Director of Finance and Operations for Crossref. Um, I am joined by my colleague, Emily Cook. Emily, are you on? I am here, can you hear me? Yes. Great, and you may, I don't know if you can see me, you may have to turn on my video from your end, but I am here. Great, uh, so we're gonna go through uh, the formal portions of the annual meeting, the election results, um, and a few, quick items of background on um, our organizational structure. Uh, there will also be a couple points for audience participation. I will call for a couple motions that members, uh, any member in the meeting can move. Um, so let's get underway. These, as a quick overview of why we find ourselves here today, we are, Crossref is a 501c6 trade association. Um, which means we are governed by our members. Uh, and as part of that, we held an annual meeting. Um, and during the annual meeting, we, co we culminate the board election where our membership base elects the seats that sit on our board of directors. Um, the board seats belong to the organization that is the member of Crossref, not the individual who takes the seat. Um, and board members come from their membership organization and represent a range of perspectives of our membership community, but in their role as board members of Crossref, they serve in Crossref's best interest. So the role of the board at Crossref is to provide strategic and financial oversight of the organization, as well as guidance to the executive director and the leadership team um, around any number of things, but including strategy, uh, organizational finances and planning, and new policies and services. Uh, the board meets three times a year, and there are also a number of board committees that do the work in between board meetings. 
um, and committees where they are comprised of board seats and non-board seats uh, that work in, to make recommendations to the board more broadly. Um, so with all of that being said, we would like to start the business portion of the meeting, um, which is conducted by me and Emily. So notice was sent on September 20th, 2022 to all Crossref members of record as of September 6th. Um, there were 16,609 members of Crossref eligible to vote in the election this year. Um, as of the record date of September 6th. Our quorum for this meeting is a minimum of 100 members. We had 1,638 members participating by proxy, um, along with those that we have on the call with us today. So we have met our quorum. Um, and I will pass it to Emily. Thanks, Lucy. Hi, everyone. I'm Emily, outside counsel to the, the organization. Crossref's board is comprised of 16 members. Um, as Lucy mentioned, each is an employee of a Crossref member organization, and the board members serve three-year terms. It's a staggered board, which means each year about a third of the board seats are up for election. And this year, there are five board seats to be filled. In accordance with Crossref's bylaws, the board is structured to maintain a rough balance between member tiers based on revenue size. Crossref's nominees are chosen by the nominating committee. You can see up on the screen. This is a group of representatives from five Crossref members, three of whom currently serve on the board and two who do not. And it's always the rule that none of the nominating committee members can come from member organizations who have a candidate on the slate. The purpose of the NOMCOM is to review and create the slate each year for nominations to the board, and they do so endeavoring to ensure fair representation of membership. As you can see, this is the 2022 nominating committee, and we really thank each and every one for their service. It's a big job and a really important one, so thanks, everyone. You see? Um, okay, so just a quick overview of the nominating process that resulted in the slate this year. Uh, the committee considers the board's current composition um, and thinks about how to build a slate that will complement the remaining members on the board. We do a call, a public call for expressions of interest um, that goes out in April, May time period. Um, any sitting board member who is up for election goes through the same process. They submit an expression of interest along with everyone else. Uh, we received 40 uh, applications this year for the five seats. The committee went through every application over a series of meetings, reviewed every uh, the statements of interest of each applicant um, and focused on building a slate that would kind of expand our diversity and, and um, broaden the uh, perspectives that we currently have on the board. Um, we had a really strong group this year and um, we encourage folks to really consider if they'd be interested in the board. We, as Emily mentioned, we have half seats for um, the large member tiers and half the seats for smaller member tiers. So consider if it would be something you'd be interested in. We'll do another call um, around the same time next year, April, May. Uh, and um, yeah, give it some thought. And the so the board had put together this slate following that process. Um, and I'll pass over to Emily for the acceptance yeah. of the slate. So the nominating committee's recommended slate of seven, seven candidates for this year's five board seats is as follows, and you can see it on your screen, and the smaller organization tier for one available seat, eLife, Damian Pattinson, Pattinson Pan-Africa Science Journal, Oscar Donde. In the larger organization tier for four available seats, Clarivate, Christine Stone, Elsevier, Rose Lulier, MIT Press, Nick Lindsay, Springer Nature, 
Anjali Nowaratne, and Wiley Allen Molina. May I have a motion to formally place these names in nomination? Shout it out. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll have to unmute someone. And I think, Rosa, you may have to do it because I can't get to it. <laughs> I, looks like we have Joshua raised his hand. We'll take it. That counts. Okay. Uh, hand. Joshua, hold on just a second. Okay. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Okay, great. I, I raised the motion, but I wish you adopt it. Thank you, Joshua. May we have a second? Yeah. This is Lisa. I second. Lisa Schiff. Thanks, Thank Lisa. You, Thanks, Lisa. Joshua. We'll now share the results. The, the election was held using a third party platform, e ballot. And as Ed mentioned at the top of the meeting, the election closed today at 4 30 UTC, and the results were available and reviewed in real time. And I let Lucy announce them. Thank you. So uh, the majority of the members present at the meeting, either in person or by proxy, um, have voted to elect the following as the five new members of Crossref's Board of Electors, Board of Directors. Um, the first is Oscar Dunde from Pan Africa Science Journal. Uh, in the four large seats, we have Christine Stone from Clarivate, Rose Lulie from Elsevier, Nick Lindsay from MIT Press, and Anjali Nawaratni from Springer Nature. Um, they are now formally declared to be elected to serve as directors of Crossref. Welcome. Um, and their new terms will begin at the March 2023 board meeting. Thanks to everybody who participated in the process. Yes, thank you. Um, okay, so before we adjourn the formal meeting within the larger annual meeting, uh, is there any other membership business that anyone wants to raise? Okay, we have one more chance for audience participation. We need a motion to adjourn the formal portion of the annual meeting. You only get back to the fun stuff if we have a motion and a second. <laughs> and I can't see if they're hands. So Rosa, you have to drive the hands. Oh, thank you. Okay, do we have a second? We need a second. Do we have a second to adjourn? Lisa, thank you. Um, okay, I'm going to hand you back to Rosa. Wonderful. Thank you very much. And if, um, let's see, Ms. Ed, could you just advance the slide for me? No. If not, I'm happy to share. Oh, hi. Yeah. Hi. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> uh, the last one. Yeah. Just a sec. So uh, yeah, thank you very much, Lucy, and congratulations to our new board members. Now, um, for a little fun and connection, we invite you to join us for a few minutes for a casual chat. Um, it's an opportunity to kind of digest and react to some of the talks today converse with other community members and ask anything you want. I've added uh, in the chat a link um, that you can click or copy into a browser to join us on Spatial Chat. This is a platform that we're gonna be using for just a little bit of networking as we close out the meeting for today. Uh, you'll need to leave Zoom um, and then um, go to the browser and either log in as a guest or create a login. And um, yeah, we can all connect over there and, and have, a, have a chat and a mingle. So um, thank you to all the presenters and attendees for joining us today. Uh, that concludes our meeting for, for this year. <laughs> okay, thank you all. And I guess we'll see you 